Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the last lecture, I discussed um, the the book Al-Kafi and the author of that book Al-Kulaini. Um, what I'd like to do now is to kind of back up a little bit and, and speak about a hadith in general. You might you might think you've you, you might have been able to you know, survive all these years as, as a Muslim, for instance, without without access to a hadith, and 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 you feel like you've you've done just fine. Um, so I want to address the question of what exactly is the role of a hadith in our uh, understanding of Islam as Muslims, and why is it so vital that we have a hadith and that we that we are connected to them, that we're studying them, and these sorts of things. If you think about um, the way the way Islamic knowledge has come to us, um, it's come to us through two sources: the the Quran and the the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, sallallahu alaihi wa alihi. The Quran, of course, is clear. We have the book in front of us now, and we can we can trace its its connection back to the Prophet. Um, uh, but what you'll you'll notice is that the the Quran um, it it can it's it's guidance, um, but it's not necessarily um, sufficient guidance. And what I mean by that is that it's it's not um, it doesn't give us all the details that we that we need for for living our lives. Um, so, for instance, as an example, it'll it'll um, constantly enjoin us to pray, aqimus um, salah, aqimus salah, um, but it won't necessarily tell us how to pray. Uh, rather, it'll refer us to the Prophet and say, you know, obey the Prophet, follow the Prophet, and whatever he gives you, you follow that. Um, so it gives us the, gives us the directives, it gives us the major principles, but then it refers us to the Prophet for for practical guidance and for the for the details of how to implement those general principles in our in our lives. We have the famous tradition um, that's um, um, many our scholars uh, our scholars um, claim that it's a, a mutawatir tradition. It's, it's been narrated by so many um, uh, various individuals from from various chains that it's it's absolutely certainly um, uh, um, attributable to the Prophet. The Prophet actually did say say this tradition. It's known as Hadith al Thaqalain. Um, the Prophet says, "Inni tarikun fiikum al Thaqalain, ma in ma in tamastaktum bihima lan tadillu." كتاب الله وعترة أهل بيتي وإنهما لا يفترقا حتى يردا علي الحوض. There are various um, versions of this tradition, but they all they all come back to the same meaning. The Prophet um, says that I'm I'm leaving behind two um, two legacies, two two precious legacies, um, and as long as you hold fast to these two legacies, then you'll you'll never um, go astray. The first is the Book of God, he says, and the second is my family, my my uh, my household. And he says that these two, the Qur'an and my household, they will, will never part, they'll never veer from one another um, until they, they um, uh, are reunited with me on, on the Day of Judgment at the, at the pool. This um, tradition shows um, the, the importance of these two, two, two components. Right? The Book of God on one hand, which is in its own place, um, but right now I want to focus more on the, the second part, which is the, the Prophet's um, legacy that he's left through the Ahlul Bayt. Now later on, we will talk. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about the role of the Ahlul Bayt in, in, in um, uh, as as links between us and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi But um, right now, I want to focus on the Sunnah of the Prophet itself. All right. So let's re re rephrase things and say it like this: that Islamic knowledge comes to us in the the, the form of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Um, there's another tradition that comes from Imam Sadiq that says that there is something in the Qur'an or the prophetic example with regard to every single practical matter. Right? So every, every possible thing you can think of, every human action um, about which we want some sort of a judgment to see is it good or bad or you know, beneficial or harmful, whatever, whatever it may be, should we do it or should we not do it? Every single thing, um, there is some, some guidance that can be found either in the Qur'an or in the prophetic example, in the sunnah of the Prophet let me speak um, briefly about the relationship between um, between the the, the Sunnah, um, which is this example of the Prophet, and the um, the Ahadith, um, which are really expressions of that Sunnah. Right? Because we're leading up to 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 this. Remember the, the question I asked in the beginning was, you know, why is it important to study Ahadith? So I'm trying to trace that back to to the origin of like, where do we get our Islamic knowledge from? Right. So um, the Sunnah of the Prophet. Think of it as um, um, everything that the Prophet ever said. Right, everything he ever did, and even everything that he he didn't say. I'll explain what that, that third one means in a, in a second. So the, what the prophet did. Um, oh, let's start with what he said. What the prophet said. Um, there are times when the prophet would um, would would be in a kind of a specific teaching mode where he would have disciples in front of him and he would he would speak to them, teach them um, uh, in, in, in that that kind of a way. Sometimes it was casual conversation that would that would occur. 
um, and he would he would say things to people in passing, and they would record that, they would remember that, they would pass it on to other people. There were times when he would give sermons, formal formal lectures, formal speeches, where he would he would address um, people people on mass. Um, there are times when um, when he would actually um, dictate, uh, not so much at the Prophet's time, but definitely uh, later on in the Imam's times, where they would actually dictate, um, uh, and people would would, would write down um, as he was as he was writing um, as he was speaking. Um, the Prophet definitely did that for the Quran, where he would dictate and people would write the Quran down. Um, maybe not um, tr traditions though. Um, sometimes he would have um, debates, especially at the times of some of the imams, there would be public debates that would happen um, where, where people would come and challenge the imam and the imam would speak um, in, in rebuttal of, of the challenges that were, that were launched at them. Um, there are supplications, for instance, like Sahih Fasajadi, and so many of the supplications we have, there are instances where either the, the imam or the prophet has, has dictated a supplication and told someone that, you know, for this particular problem, this particular worry, this particular ill, this is what you should, you know, what you should say, the kind of dua you should say. Or, or people witnessed the, the, the prophet or the imam and um, saw them say a particular dua um, at a particular time, and they, they remembered that and recorded that for, for us. Um, so these are just a, 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 a kind of a, a brief list of, of different kinds of, um, of speech that we have recorded from the Prophet. All of these things, anything he ever said, is one part of the Sunnah of the Prophet. Uh, the second part is his actions. Right, the actions of the Prophet also constitute his, his Sunnah, his example. Right, so that, that's clear enough. Any, anything he did. Um, the third part is is known at, in Arabic as taqrir. Um, in, in English, uh, translated as a silent approbation. And this is where um, the Prophet would uh, uh, not say anything, not react in a negative way when something was said or something was done in, in front of him. All right, so if you think of the, ro the role of the Prophet, he's, he's there as, as a guide. His whole job is to, is to make sure that people are, are um, acting in a way that's pleasing to God. If somebody comes in and does something that's inappropriate, that's displeasing to God, and the and uh, the, the prophet he, he can't stay silent, right? Somehow he needs to communicate to that person that what he's done is is inappropriate, and he needs to reform his his actions or seek or, you know forgiveness for for what he's done. Um, if, if the prophet ever remains silent when something happens, then we can infer from his silence that the the thing that was said or the thing that was done must have been okay with him. He must have been he must have approved of of that. Or you know possibly he was in a position where he wasn't able to to express it, or you know. But but generally that's the case that he um, his his silence um, in in um, in the face of of actions is uh, is an, uh, an indication that he was pleased with those actions. All of these three parts, um, three kinds of uh, things that I've mentioned so far, constitute um, the sunnah of the prophet. The ahadith that we have. Um, traditions. Let me let me explain that that term because I keep on using that term, and I want to make sure that you understand what it is. Um, the word hadith um, it has a couple of synonyms that are used um, interchangeably in Arabic. Um, so we use the word hadith, the plural of which is ahadith, um, or um, we'll use the word khabar, and the plural of that is akhbar, or riwaya and riwayat. So all of these these three words and their plurals are all all synonyms. Um, I, I translate them as as traditions. And when I say traditions, I mean um, um, really expressions um, and narrations of the Sunnah of the Prophet, right? So they're they're they're, they're um, you know words, they're descriptions of um, uh, um, what the Prophet did, or they're narrations of what the Prophet said, or or descriptions of circumstances where something happened and the Prophet didn't say anything, and and, and from that we can infer, like I said, we can infer uh, infer his uh, approval. Um, we also have a hadith that deal with other things besides the sunnah. So, for instance, we have a lot of historical traditions, historical ahadith that's, that speak about you know other things that happened in history. Um, maybe not with regards to the prophet in particular, but other circumstances, you know, kings and wars and, and different things that happened at the time. Those are also um, narrated in ahadith, um, but those aren't going to necessarily they don't reflect the, the behavior of the prophet necessarily. They they reflect more the circumstances and, and uh, um, kind of the, the, the goings on uh, around around the prophet. All right, so if let's go back and 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 um, recatch that thread. So I mentioned um, Hadith al-Thaqalain, that um, Islamic knowledge is bound up in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet, and we need to hold fast to these two things in order to access Islamic knowledge and through that in order to um, get closer to Allah. Um, the Sunnah of the Prophet is um, it reaches us 
Unfortunately, because we don't have contact, we didn't have contact directly with the Prophet, it, the only way the Sunnah of the Prophet reaches us is through these ahadith. Right? So if we are going to act on the Prophet's um, exhortation to hold fast to these two parts of Islamic knowledge, right, we have to necessarily not only be steadfast in our reading and our understanding and our acting on the Qur'an, but likewise the ahadith. Right? So it's extremely important um, for our Islamic learning to, ha to have both comp components. Necessarily then, if somebody leaves off uh, one or, or of course both of these two components, the Qur'an or the Hadith, then their, their understanding of Islam is going to be lacking, skewed, and their, their actions are also going to be um, uh, improper. We have, um, we have a historical um, re record of, of an incident that happened towards the end of the Prophet's life, um, when he was on his deathbed. Um, uh, uh, Al-Bukhari, Muslim, um, um, and Tabaqat ibn Sa'd also narrate this and many other, other um, uh, historians and um, hadith um, compilers have mentioned this, this, um, this incident where the Prophet um, was on his deathbed he um, um, asked for um, a, a pen and, um, and a paper to be brought so that he could write something um, and he, he says, I'll, I'll write something um, af uh, after which you will never, you will, you'll, you'll never go astray um, and um, one of the companions made a, 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 a statement. Um, so uh, Ibn Sa'd, for instance, narrates it. He says, قَالَ عُمَرْ إِنَّ النَّبِي قَدْ غَلَبَهُ الْوَجَعْ وَعِنْدَكُمُ الْقُرْآنَ حَسْبُنَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ right, So the second Khalifa, he, he says that the, um, the Prophet has been overcome by his, his sickness and, and, and the pain that he's experiencing on his deathbed. Um, he says, you, you, have, you have the Qur'an. The Qur'an is sufficient for you. Right, it's, the the book of God is sufficient for us. We don't need you know, any other um, any other less exhortations from from the Prophet. So that kind of an um, an attitude is is exactly what the Prophet is trying to, to to stop us from doing. He wants us to hold fast to both the Kitab Allah, the book of God, and the Hadith of the Prophet. Um, disregarding either of those two is going to lead us lead us astray. Oftentimes, I hear people. Um, almost in exasperation, say that they don't want to um, get involved with a hadith because they've, they've heard um, various things about um, a hadith being unreliable, sometimes contradictory. Um, and in short, that there, there are problems with a hadith. Um, whereas as Muslims, we, we know that the Qur'an is the word of God and it's perfect and there, there is no, um, no contradiction or discrepancy within the Qur'an. And so their conclusion is, since we have problematic knowledge and we have perfect knowledge, let's leave off the problem, problematic knowledge, throw that out, and just take the Qur'an itself. What they're, actually, what they're doing is also hasbuna kitabullah. They're also saying that we can, we can suffice with one part of guidance and they're disregarding a, a vast, a vast um, wealth of guidance that's been given to us. And in so doing, they're going against the, the, the exhortation of the, of the Prophet. And we don't, we, don't do this, we don't do this with other aspects of our life. We have you know, um, difficult, difficult um, um, areas of, 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 of human learning. We have problems with, with various fields. Um, our solution is not to simply disregard those and, and, and um, throw, throw kind of that, that whole field out because there are problems in, in, in kind of um, um, sorting through the information and deciding what's right and what's wrong. Instead, we, we either um, kind of gain expertise in that field and figure out how to, how to kind of um, wade through information, how to sort through and, and how to kind of establish truth and, 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 um, and, and falsehood. Um, or if we, if we can't do it ourselves, we refer to people who can. Or we find experts who, 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 are, who know how to wade through that field and then we hold their hand and, and allow them to guide us through and show us the way, show us what's, what's, what's what. Um, if, if, our, if our attitude was, was to cast away anything that's problematic, then we would have very little left um, to, to learn in terms of human, human knowledge. So that's, that's definitely not the right thing to do. If, if there are problems in a hadith, and there are, and I will address them later, inshallah, one of the coming lectures, I'd like to speak about um, some of the pitfalls, some of the, the difficulties that are there inherently in the study of a hadith. Just as a, as a teaser, we have we have contradictions sometimes. We have the imams, you know, saying to do something and then not to do something. We have them praising someone and then saying something bad about somebody. Um, we have you know all, all sorts of different problems like that. We have a hadith that have been uh, falsified and fabricated and attributed to the prophet falsely in our collections of, of, of traditions. Um, we have you know traditions that that deify the imams, for instance. We have. Traditions that, that say the Quran is, is incomplete or, you know, and, and these sorts of things. So we have all, uh, problematic traditions, undoubtedly. Um, 
But the, the presence of those problematic traditions does not mean that we should therefore take all of our traditions and just throw, cast them away and say, I can't benefit from them. Rather, let's either gain expertise or rely on experts and allow them to help us to, to, to sort through all of these um, and, and, and see you know, where, where does truth lie, what do we do with those, those other uh, traditions and, and so forth. So we can, we can reach guidance, um, but it takes patience and it takes learning. What I've spoken about today is um, the need uh, that we have as Muslims for a hadith. Right? To say that our, our Islamic knowledge is incomplete without both components of the Qur'an and the, and the Sunnah. Now undoubtedly, on, on, on the ground, um, there are prerequisites uh, for someone to be able to avail himself of the, the knowledge that's in a hadith. Right? It's not something that you can just um, open up and, and read and, and, and translate directly um, into, into action. That's not the case. Um, there are there are um, prerequisites. There are certain methodologies that have to be um, have to have to be used to be able to benefit from a hadith and translate them into action. Um, so we'll we'll get to that as well um, later. That there are prerequisites and, and how, how can how can you as somebody who may not be a specialist in um, in Islamic studies how can you benefit from a hadith? Um, so that's that's uh, that's a separate issue. But right now I'm speaking on a on a more general level. That as Muslims, in order to get um, Islamic knowledge, we need to be able to benefit from both of these. And that's the role that these collections like um, Al, Al Kafi um, and similar collections play. They are the the vehicle that's going to bring us those traditions, so that we can um, we can access this this um, uh, vast reservoir of knowledge that they contain. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.